Thank you very much. Good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, excuse me that this title on the first sheet is not exactly the same as the title that I um, sent by email to the organization committee. The organization committee that I would like to thank very much for inviting me here, and uh, I'd like to thank you for being in the audience after such a long day. Um, I really respect your stamina. Um, yesterday evening, I had one of the most wonderful dinners that I had in my life. It was a gorgeous dinner. And I had a conversation with Ruvi Dar, who had this presentation this morning. And it, we found out that both of us are sort of studying Italian. Yeah, vogliamo parlare italiano. Hey, leggere, scrivere, tutti. Allora, è meglio per me di continuare in inglese. Certamente è meglio per voi. Um, the thing is, what we found out is both of us are using an app on the, t a telephone, or on the telephone and on the computer, and it's an app that teaches you Italian. And I tell you, it's important for, for the introduction here, because what the system does, it, it, it gives you, say, an I Italian phrase, you have to translate it to English, for English back to Italian, you, got to, you have to hear it, you have to speak it, etc. So you approach these languages from various points, and that appears to be very, very good for the encoding of the information. So it's repetition, and looking at things from different sides is good for the consolidation of the information. And the reason why I make this point is that there will be quite some overlap between the work that was presented by Richard McNally and the work that I'd like to present. So this may be a drawback, but on, the good thing is that it may help you consolidate the ideas about network theory. <laughs> Long introduction. Um, I am extremely enthusiastic about network approaches that have that started a couple of years ago um, by Borsbaum, and there's a, f a few reasons why I'm so enthusiastic. One of them is that many of us have some lingering doubts about the rationality of DSM and ICD sort of systems. Um, but then again, if you don't have a viable alternative, I mean, what can you do? But it seems that the idea behind these network theories are maybe extremely viable. Um, and what I especially appreciate is that the network theories account for all the things that have been accounted for by existing systems, but it does more. Not only does it explain what other approaches do explain, but it explains much more, and the explanatory power is potentially very good. And what makes it, for me, especially interesting is that this approach from physics originally, or sometimes sociology or biology, um, fun, funny enough, converges very much with insights from a very def different angle, which is experimental psychopathology. And we are converging in the sense that symptoms or complaints are not merely output from an underlying disorder, but symptoms in and by themselves may be causally affecting other complaints. So I'd like to make this point in this um, presentation. What I'd like to do is first make a few notes on explanation and pseudo-explanation in psychiatry, and I will focus on a very common misconception, a very common um, type of fallacious reasoning, um, which is a DSM-inspired tautology, and then discuss searches for alternatives. Um, first of all, the searching for the pathophysiology of mental disorders, and then discuss an alternative, which is symptom-to-symptom -symptom approaches. Now we'll discuss two var varieties of it, network theory, experimental psychopathology, and I will close with some concluding remarks, although unfortunately I took along the wrong, well, so, no, it, it, it's, it's all right, but I took along a version of this presentation that excludes the concluding remarks, but I'll make it up by heart. Well then, the received view is that somehow psychosis serves as an explanation for hallucinations. So you have a patient with hallucinations, you're wondering how come, and then the answer is it's psychosis that explains the hallucinations. We have a person with a low mood, and we're wondering what about the low mood, and we say, what well, is depression? And it's all too common that people say, now I understand why I am so low, it is because of the depression. 
why does someone have panic attacks is because of the panic disorder and it's very common for for parents to say now I know why Johnny is so restless it's not because he's just inobedient but he suffers from ADHD apparently ADHD is a serving explanation for the door in general then we have symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, being explained by underlying psychiatric disorders. Like we have major depression serving as the cause of several symptoms that are the depressive symptoms. Now there's a problem with this approach. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's important to realize and from my experience Although it sounds very logical, it is hard to get it across. And I've tried it with various audiences, and once in a, very often you find that people find it hard to grasp. So I'll do my very, very best to really get the message across. DSM disorders are defined by symptoms. The symptoms in themselves constitute the disorder. And therefore, claiming that the disorders cause the symptoms is a logical fallacy. Disorders are symptoms and not causes of the symptoms. It's like saying Peter is rich. Why is he rich? Because he owns a lot of money. Which is entirely tautological because being rich is being defined by having a lot of money. And if you want to have a true explanation, it must be defined independently. And this is a variety of the case that was presented in passing by the rich. Now here we have the case of a person that is a, a, on holiday and he's being overrun by a car and he's being brought to the hospital with the, 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 the suspicion that there may be brain damage or skull damage. And then a picture is being made, of MRI of the brain and incidentally a tumour is being found. Now the patient does not complain about symptoms, it's about the lung cancer that you were talking about. So we have the patient and the neurologist, the neurologist is saying to him, the good news is nothing wrong with your skull, but that's bad news, and as we, we have the suspicion of something malingering over there, so I strongly advise you to put you home to get to the doctor. And the guy says, I don't have, don't have any complaints. And the response, of course, is, well, you may have not, be, not explained, but if you don't go to the doctor, you will get explained. I, I'm, very, I'm, I'm, I'm very worried about that, that you may get it. So this is a perfectly reasonable and realistic way of reasoning. Now suppose that we have the case of a major depression, we have a disorder without symptoms. I'm afraid, okay, we'll see how far I get because I thought I'd never... Okay, um, <laughs> I have several um, varieties of this presentation. I'll, 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 I'll find my way through. Um, but if we say you have, a, you have a depression without being depressed, suppose we have a fly phobia. And you, you have this, this patient and the doctor or psychologist saying you have a fly phobia and, and this so-called phobia saying, I like flying, I came in by, 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 by plane. And it would be logically absurd to say that the guy is suffering from a fly phobia. And this, of course, is absurd because the fly phobia or the depression is defined by its very symptoms, which is not the case with the tumour. And of course we are not the first one to realize this, and if you, <coughs> then, um, <laughs> I'm dual processing now, <laughs> if, if you're wondering, um, if we are not the first one to, to, to realize that disorders are not serving as valid explanation of symptoms, because they constitute the problem. It's like saying that the, 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 um, that Rome is the cause of the streets and the buildings of Rome. Are the streets and the buildings and the, uh, of Rome caused by Rome? No, it's not. The buildings and the streets are Rome. It's the same. Um, and we're not the first one to, to realize that. It's not a new argument. And um, one way to try and solve it is to say, well, we shouldn't take the disorder as an explanation of symptoms. We should look for explanations of the disorder. And we should like for the underlying pathogenic mechanism, the pathophysiology or pathogenic process in general, that causes the disorder. So, what we should look for is the underlying pathogenic processes of major depression. So, what we would then need 
is independent markers of pathogenic processes. So we have a disorder that is sort of, that is the symptoms which we want to have processes that are causing that complex. Now, of course, what you would like to have is a sound physiological pathway, a, 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 a physiological or, or, or a psychophysiological or a psychobiological cascade of events. But at least what you would like to have is some independent markers of that processes, like MRI data, fMRI data, genes, transmitters, psychological tests, etc., that would serve the same role as the diagnosis of a, 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 a tumor in the brain. Um, unless, however, after decade, decades of research, there's not a hint of such a marker. And a marker, of course, is a minimum that you would ask from this sort of research. Um, and I, I, I think that in the Netherlands alone, about 5 million euro a year are being spent on psych biological psychiatry, psychiatric research. Now, if you would think that we, in worldwide, would be about a couple of percent, like 2 3 percent of the world budget, that would, would amount to an enormous amount of money. Like, I can, in, in, a, in a decade, like a, a thousand million dollars worldwide being spent on biological psychiatry. It may be half of it, but it, it, it boils down to an enormous lot of money. And I'm afraid that we have to conclude that despite all the efforts, we have not the beginning of a laboratory test that tells us if somebody's depressed, psychotic, suffering from OCD, independent from the symptoms. <coughs> now, what you can do, of course, excuse me, but I, uh, what I would <coughs> ask you is to have some mercy on me and let me change to another version of this uh, slideshow as I'm afraid that I'm showing you not the one that I had in mind. Oh well. Could you help me out? Yes. Okay. Okay. You go to file. Okay, that's the second one. The second, yeah. Excuse me for that. So that was the idea to go for underlying pathophysiology that might explain the disorder. If that you need the independent uh, markers or the processes that, alas, have not been found, and it's not that, that not enough effort has been made, but apparently it's very hard. Now again, the question is then how to proceed, given that. It's apparently so hard to find genes or, or biological markers anyhow. Um, one may say, well, we have been looking for it, we've been researching it, but possibly not hard enough. So why not keep on trying and take another two or three decades and possibly we'll come up with the whole the, the, the holy grail. Um, and it, of course it cannot be ruled out that with more effort we will eventually come up with these so desired biological markers. Another approach, however, would be to treat symptoms not as causally inert output, but as input. What I mean is this. Suppose somebody suffers from lasting stress, and this may, and this is just a very simple, naive beginning, may have made a result in lowered mood. Now, lowered mood, of course, or of course, yeah, it's not very far-fetched to see that, as, 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 considering the, the emotion-cognition interactions, that it 
may result in self-reproach. In that case, the major depression is not needed to explain the self-reproach. But if self-reproach induces um, insomnia and having all these horrible thoughts at night, then major depression may not be needed to explain insomnia. Insomnia may induce fatigue and concentration problems, and major depression is not needed for the explanation of fatigue. So you end up with not in being in need of depression and saying, this is depression. This is what constitutes the depression, and this is what psychiatry, psychiatric disorders are made of. This is not some funny aspect of psychiatric disorders, but this is the very essence. This is the stuff what psychiatric disorders are made of. The same story, by and large, can be told about other, um, or the same argument can be made for other disorders. So we had a lot of stress and coffee, and had some ice plane bodily symptoms. This will not necessarily result in a fear of fainting or a misinterpretation, but it may, but it, 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 it induces some risks of misinterpretation, showing that you don't need to have a panic disorder to begin with for this transition. We may have a fear of a new episode, agoraphobic avoidance. A panic disorder is not needed as an explanation. What is, need, what is sufficient is to say that this cascade of events is the very heart of the panic disorder. Now, from, as I told you, from a very different angle, and which has been discussing that this morning, the point was made by um, some others, um, that symptoms are connected to other symptoms. And you can look at the presence of connections, you can look at this, the strength of the connections, the, 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 the more solid the lines, the stronger the connections. Here we have... Well, you, it's, you can't read it, but it's not that important because I'm not talking about depression and GAD, but just take it as a case example. Here we have depressive symptoms. Here we have symptoms that are shared by depression and by GAD. And here we have GAD um, symptoms. You see connections between the lines, you can calculate them. This is, just, this is not a, a, a virtual, theoretical exercise. These are actual empirical data. And you can look at how symptoms are related to other symptoms. About the question of causality, I'm coming to, you know, I'll talk about it later on. But you can at least calculate them. And then in passing, come up with a very parsimonious explanation of the existence of comorbidity. Because comorbidity is not something that's theoretically worrisome. You don't have to come up with various underlying processes for the various comorbid disorders. What, is, what this theory suggests, theoretically, and shows empirically, is that there are bridge symptoms, symptoms shared, with other dis shared between disorders, increasing the risk for the development of such a network and such a network, and, and parsimoniously explaining the coexistence of these um, disorders. Another thing is that the disorder is, is conceived of as a cluster of symptoms, including the notion that symptoms will affect or may will affect other symptoms, including reciprocally. So loops may ensue between symptoms, symptoms A reinforcing symptom B and the other way around. And, and assumptions about underlying pathophysiology may be right, but they're not needed. So it's a, it's a simple system that says we, we, you, don't need to sim you don't need any assumption about pathophysiology. Um, it gives a powerful and sophisticated mathematical modeling and graphic, graphic representation, um, and it identifies central sy symptoms and peripheral symptoms, thereby suggesting a, an agenda for treatment and for research. And inter interestingly and importantly, crucially, um, this is not sort of a, a postmodern deconstructivistic uh, relativism, um, as if there are no real psychiatric clusters of symptoms. There are. I mean, if you have a patient coming up with complaints about checking and uncertainty, you better in ask questions about uh, cleaning behavior, etc., because you know the relationship between checking and cleaning is quite obvious. If the patient claims about panic attacks, you better ask for agoraphobic avoidance. But if somebody has 
tells you about agoraphobic avoidance of panic attacks, I mean, you may ask for OCD, but it's not that likely. So there are real reliable clusters, and they have been recognized for a long time. So there's nothing new. But the good thing is that this is just accepted and explained by the network theory. So you're not dealing with some fake, quasi-scientific, uh, relativistic sort of thing, but these empirical things are really uh, were accepted as they are. Uh, but they do give a very fundamental criticism on the root cause view, the idea that there is an underlying sort of disorder that's steering the um, symptoms. And as I told you, it gives a very elegant explanation for this, um, for the comorbidity, the comorbidity rule, that's very, it's very nice, it's a 50% rule. So, saying that if you've got, in a ship, well, it's an empirical rule, if you've got one DSM disorder, the chance of having another one is around 50%. If you've got two disorders, the chance of having a third one, more, is again 50%. If you've got three ones, the chance of more is not 50 So, com comorbidity is not an exception, but it's a rule, and um, that is a rule is explained by a theory, and moreover, it specifies what patterns of comorbidity are out there. There are no markers, but no, no clear independent markers of psych psychopathology, and network theory says, we, well, you don't need to mark us, and the absence of markers is basically what you might explain. And if you find markers, they are likely to be very broad, like neuroticism or something, some very general risk factors, including their genetic basis, of course. Um, and what I find interesting is that this line of reasoning converges very good with experimental psychopathology. Because in experimental psychopathology, take the case of phobias. I mean, it's been around for a very long time. We have anxiety, of course, being a strong motivator for behavior. The behavior being safety behavior, in particular, avoidance. But for decades, it's clear that it works the other way around as well. Avoidance reinforces anxiety. Safety behaviors like prevent this confirmation and in that way reinforce anxiety, which is a notion that is very compatible, of course, with network theory, saying these anxiety and avoidance are not just output phenomenon, but they are reinforcing one, one another. Um, panic disorder is the same sort of story. We've got the, the, the physical symptoms, it's a diagnostic criterion. We have fear of dying, losing control, etc. Catastrophic misinterpretations. And the idea is that the fact that these things are hanging together is not because they have a common root, but because they are mutually reinforcing. OCD, OCD may be the clearest case. I mean, we have um, people here in the audience, like Ruvi Darn, like Francesco Mancini, like. Uh, uh, Ganjami, Amelia, sorry, um, Amelia Ganjami, um, working on the idea that, um, and that Rich McNally, of course, working on the idea that OCD, again, is a disorder that is ma being maintained by a system affecting other, by, by the uh, symptoms affecting other systems, like doubt and uncertainty may stimulate compulsive, compulsive checking, for instance. But compulsive checking, there's a lot of experimental work that we and others have been doing in this area. If you, if you have this doubt about your memory and you start to check, there's nothing wrong with that. You check once, it's okay. You check twice, that's okay. But once you start checking more, like five times, there's an ironical effect occurring. The, the uncertainty will not go down but it will go up. So there we have a very clear example of compulsions having an opposite effect and increasing doubt and uncertainty. Um, and you could you could easily show that you you need certain people. If, if people have a sort of a subclinical inclination to OCD, and you induce mild doubt, mild uncertainty, I'm not giving to the data here, but we have a series of experiments, and these are very reliable, robust effects. So you, we started off with 
um, people with subclinical OCD, just students. And we brought them in non-uncertain situations, so they had a very easy choice between similar, I don't get into the details, and they behave exactly as other ones. Once you make the situation ambiguous and you have to make a choice between ambiguous events, then you say a very reliable effect occurring without breeds perseveration, which is dangerous perseveration. I mean, and we repeated it recently with a group of OCD patients with non-OCD anxious controls and with normal controls. So big studies just like you did, which is sort of the proof of the pudding. Is it a general anxiety phenomenon? Or is it an OCD specific phenomenon? It's an OCD specific phenomenon in the sense that these people start to have the compulsions, or start to specify. Um, there's other examples. Oops. That's a work from here in Italy, um, mainly by Francesco, focusing on guilt and responsibility, showing that responsibility and guilt drives compulsion. You can induce responsibility and guilt, you, can, you get. You induce the behavior that is um, uh, defining the disorders. And in general, it seems that um, for general, if, if for anxiety disorders, that certain stimuli perceived as threatening, they induce anxiety, but threat beliefs, of course, threat, is, threat has a, a direct motivational effect. It, it, it stimulates safety behavior, safety behavior leaves threat beliefs unaffected. Um, so I think from different backgrounds, systems theory and experimental psychology, um, we came to very comparable conclusions, uh, suggesting that the, the, the idea of root causes, of underlying pathophysiology, or pathology, um, may be fundamentally wrong. And we may, may be misled by the enormous progress in, in biomedical medicine. So, well, we're here we have psychopathology and we should adopt the same system and look for underlying causes. And this may have been mistaken. And perhaps even the words symptom and disorders are very misleading. And Rich has been pointing to that as well. Because the very notion of a symptom seems to refer that it results from some underlying malfunctioning, some underlying disorder or, or disordered process. So the word symptom is it's like Wittgenstein said, we, we can be bewitched by the language. So we have the language symptom and the word symptom directly suggests that it relates to something that's beyond it. And the word disorder in itself suggests that there's something disordered which became, become manifest in symptoms.